Hi guys, welcome back to Jeff's channel. My name is Paige, and remember to smash that subscribe button and notification bell on Jeff's YouTube and Twitch videos. Thank you. All right, that was awesome. Thank you, Paige, for that. Hey, welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Curse of Oak Island and Beyond live stream. I am your host, Jeff Freeman, and right over here, I have my co-host, Jack Campbell. How you doing, Jack? Good. Good afternoon, Jeff. Today, folks, we are very we have our very, very special guest with us today, Jake Roberts. Jake, welcome to the show. Thank yes. you for coming. Thank hey, you. Thanks, thanks for having me, guys. This, this is a lot of fun. Yeah, I was I tell you what, and this is one of those, and I say this a lot, but this is one of those folks that I have been looking forward to for quite a long time because uh, the more that I get involved in researching my own little bit of research, nothing like these guys do, believe me. But uh, getting involved in this a little bit too with uh, Sir Francis Bacon and some of this stuff, I tell you what, the more I get involved in it, the more I find it so very fascinating. And I, I could not wait to have Jake on with us today yeah. because he was going to be able to take us into some areas that he's done. He's got his own podcast. And don't forget, he's it's the, uh, um, I'm sorry, the ghost of bacon.com. Is that correct? Did I get that yeah. right? Yeah, you got it right, Jeff. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Go, and go tell you what, yeah, it's it's great stuff. And uh, anyway, so as we get started here, I wanted to kind of jump into a little bit of your background, as I often do with our guests when we have them on. I know that you are an author, obviously, uh, a researcher, but you're also a teacher. Is that correct? Y yes. Uh, I've, I've been an English teacher for almost 30 years now. Um, I think I'm in my 28th year of teaching. Wow. Yeah. Fascinating. Now, that's a high school teacher, you said, I think, something like yes. that? Okay, yeah, wow. Well, high school English. Uh, I teach um, uh, senior English as well as a uh, college-level uh, uh, English 101 class uh, mm -hmm. through uh, SUNY Potsdam, the local college. Right. Wow. So I tell you what, folks, if he tells you to sit up and pay attention, then we better do it. And we raise your hand if you want to ask a question. <laughs> wow, that's yeah. fascinating. I, I can't, uh, you know, so I, I understand uh, that that gives you a very good perspective on not only doing your your research and then being able to present it to everyone so that they can understand it and soak it in. So, and I kind of felt like that today for myself personally that I would be as a student here because again, you're the teacher here, and I've got my and I'm old school, so I got my pen and I got my paper and I'm ready to take some notes. You know, like like the old days, not like today where they probably got laptops and whatever they're taking their notes okay. out. Yeah, don't give so, me uh, <laughs> one of so, the things I wanted to know, yeah. what drew you to it in the first place? Yeah, that was actually a question from Sherry Dugan. Uh, she wanted to know that. She asked about uh, uh, how did you get interested in this and why Sir Francis Bacon? You know, it's such a, a big question, really, because I mean, I've been a fan of the show, The Curse of Oak Island, since it began, mm -hmm. simply because I, I'm a student of symbolism as an English teacher, obviously, um, and I've always been... Uh, really fascinated with the uh, Bacon Shakespeare connection. Again, as an English teacher, I, I, I love Shakespeare. And <clears throat> so, but watching the show, I, I, and I'm, you know, uh, I have to, you know, be perfectly candid here. I, I was always a bit skeptical about what was on Oak Island. Um, I'm not a skeptic because that's someone who usually just dismisses mm -hmm. <laughs> whatever evidence is there for whatever they want to believe. Um, that's at least that's been my experience, but I was skeptical because I wanted to see, well, actually like, um, Marty Lagina, you know, he wanted Marty, to see, yeah. he wanted to see scientific evidence. So did I, um, and, yeah, I want to see it. And so, uh, season six that that happened, uh, suddenly, you know, they had the dendrochronology of, of, uh, the U-shaped structure in, in Smith's Cove. And, and I thought, wow, okay. Uh, that that's really interesting. Something significant happened there. Uh, then, of course, you know the uh, the lead cross. Of course, is another uh, really uh, huge piece of evidence um, yeah. that, that was hard. It's right there, and you can hold it in your hand, or they can hold it in their hand. Um, yeah. So those kinds of things suddenly kind of really piqued my interest. And then when my um, my good friend Chris Dona was on the show. And he mentioned um, the Royal Arch. Now, he, when he was talking about the Royal Arch, he was talking about, uh, astronomically speaking, the Royal Arch in the sky. But when he said that, my ears perked up because I, I felt that um, what I saw happening on Oak Island had to do with what's called the Royal Arch degree of Freemasonry. And so I emailed him because, you know, we, we work together, we're friends. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, you just said this on the show. 
Um, here's what I think has been going on. And he says, really, or the way Chris says it, he's like, really is the way he always <laughs> says it. Um, I, and he says, well, you should really write that up and, and send that in. You know, I said, well, for what it's worth, I'm sure they already know this, you know, and you know, it, it was that kind of a thing. So I, I wrote it up and I sent it in and, um, and then I started really looking into it more in depth. Um, and then, uh, Chris contacted me and Chris Morford, um, uh, had emailed me mm -hmm. and they were looking at Shakes what's called Shakespeare's plaque, you know, the, the plaque on Shakespeare's funerary monument in Stratford upon Avon and Holy Trinity church. And, they said, well, you know, we're looking at steganography, uh, the, basically the geometry of how letters line up on it and finding Bacon's name, you know, encrypted in it and that kind of a thing. And I, and I thought that was really cool. And I've always been a fan of uh, Peter Amundsen's work. Yep. Uh, he did with, you know, uh, the plaque and uh, Shakespeare and how he associated it with Oak Island. Mm -hmm. And so I, I decided I, I would take a look at it. And when I did, what happened was uh, the very first thing I noticed was uh, all of the conjoined characters, the letters that are, uh, uh, there's an M-E that's all one character. There's an N-T right next to it. And, and of course, the, the T-H, which is actually a double or triple tau symbol, uh, as it turns out. Um, and so I saw all these conjoined characters. And in my mind, I said, well, that's obviously a transposition cipher. Um, and what that means, uh, is that the letters just need to be rearranged according to whatever the keys happen to be, and it will create an algorithm that will rearrange the characters and produce messages. And so that was the approach I took. Uh, you know, I, I didn't take the whole idea of, uh, using geometry to align all of the different characters. Instead, I, I said, well, I think I know what the keys are. And as it turns out, I was right. <laughs> and so uh, it, it, the algorithm started producing uh, very obvious uh, messages that were from Francis Bacon and uh, the Rosicrucians, uh, the Rosa, Fra Rosa Cross. And yep. so uh, from that point on, I was, I was sucked in and started tumbling down the rabbit hole. And when I shared this information um, with the guys on Island, on Oak Island, um, it was funny. Uh, I didn't even know if anyone had read it. <laughs> You know, uh, that's one of the things about uh, when when theorists send in their stuff and if any perspective theorists out there, if you plan on sending in your theories and stuff, uh, you, you don't really know if it gets seen or not. And, um, and because you have to understand, they just get such a huge volume of information they present them all the time um, that, you know, mine, I figured it just landed in a stack of papers and they might get to it eventually. And uh, but with my most um, previous recent one. Uh, the one that I presented on, uh, as soon as I sent that in, probably within a couple of days, there were a couple of people who were on the show and remain nameless who, who friended me on Facebook. <laughs> so I took that as a good sign. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and so, uh, you know, I reached out to them and said, Hey, you know, thanks. Um, and, and lo and behold that, uh, next thing, you know, uh, uh Chris and I were presenting, um, in the end of August in September or beginning of September, uh, Aaron and I, uh, Aaron, um, Helton and I collaborated on uh, a presentation uh, and we presented that in September as well. And um, so, you know, it, it, it's one of those things where even when you do a, a presentation and it's really well received at that point, it was pretty late in the season. So uh, I think they pretty much had everything planned out of how they were going to be approaching, uh, you know, the coronation and, and COVIDness of <laughs> this yeah. last season of Oak Island. And it was a huge challenge for them. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, you know, that, that, that was kind of my experience and how I ended up getting into it. Wow. That's fascinating too. And, and knowing that, you know, like you talked about Sir Francis Bacon and his ciphers, mm -hmm. um, and, and I mentioned to you just in the pre-show just a few moments ago that we were talking about, there was, he had probably like six different types of ciphers that he employed into. Now, I didn't know if he used them all in the same you know, at the same time, all these things, because that would really confuse me beyond what I'm already confused. But is that true? He had like several different ones <laughs> that he used that one, you know, in things. Yeah. Yeah. And th that's the crazy part, Jeff. Uh, he, he actually does. Uh, they, a lot of the cipher systems uh, work in conjunction with one another. Uh, and that was one of the features that I discovered um, while working at it, because other researchers have always, uh, you know, pointed out how you can calculate uh, his name 
uh, based upon simple cipher and uh, the name Bacon equals the number 33, Francis equals 67, and so on. And, you know, and then you could do the same thing for reverse cipher and K cipher, the three main ones that most people know about. Um, and so, but I had never seen anyone show the relationship between all three of these and how they actually work together. And while I was, uh, since I knew those ciphers and as I was looking at this plaque, suddenly uh, things started to make sense. And so uh, that, that was really kind of um, what led me down uh, that path. And so uh, I, I, it was quite a learning curve. Uh, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll put it that way. Right. Um, you know, you know, I, yeah, I, I understood how the uh, individual ciphers worked, but then as I started working with them, I discovered how they actually interact with one another. And um, and as I when I made that discovery, suddenly the messages started appearing, and uh, that was that was a pretty amazing moment. Right, and he had to be. I mean, and again, this is something that we kind of mentioned in the pre-show there. That his mind. I mean, somebody to be able to to put that all together. Uh, you mentioned something about he did his first cipher when he was like 16 years old, but the mindset yeah. to be able to, obviously he's, he was on another level beyond way beyond what I, my thinking would be to be able to combine all those together and put together a message. And I think what they call it, uh, stegra uh, steganography, steganography. Uh, yes. <laughs> I don't know why I was <laughs> with those words, but that's like taking a, a hidden message within an ordinary message, right? Is right. that how that's basically described? And he was able to do this not only with one cyber, but, but with multiple. Oh. And it just blows my mind that his his level of thinking is way beyond, you know, what I can ever imagine. Yeah, and and as it started to unfold, it, the very first thing I noticed was I, th that this it felt impossible, uh, mm -hmm. you know. And that's one of the things that, that people say to me. They say, you know, um, I think it's impossible that he could have done that. And my answer is always, well, it's impossible that I could have or you could have. Uh, but I don't think it wasn't impossible for him. And he did it. Uh, that, that's how amazing he was. Um, and, I, you know, during your pre-show, uh, we were just talking. And, and I, you know, I still say, you know, um, he was probably the greatest mind of the last 500 years. I just it, it's it's. Mind boggling, and he did it so he could hide everything so easily, right? Plain sight, and nobody would know what it was. Exactly, Jack. And you know, uh, that was one of the questions um, that people asked me early on. You know, well, why would Sir Francis Bacon? Um, and I, you know, I, I've talked about this uh, in the past on my show. Uh, why would Sir Fran Francis Bacon go through all the trouble to encode a cipher into this plaque that people walking by it will never see it if no one was ever intended to read it? And, and I say, that's the question. That's a great question because that means that people were intended to read it and mm -hmm. understand it. Um, the amount of effort it, it must have taken uh, to do this. Um, and like I said, I, I always use the term mind boggling, but I can't, I, I can't think of anything else. Right. Um, and so first of all, the people around him that he surrounded himself with, uh, they were all, you know, some of the best minds of the time and they understood his ciphers. They, we're in the know in terms of, uh, of how to decrypt it. Yeah. Yeah. They're in the club. <laughs> right. Um, and so, um, yeah, you know, that's really what it was all about. And, um, in, in fact, uh, his, his secretary and, and, uh, uh, chaplain, uh, uh, William Raleigh, uh, in, in Manus Verulamiani, uh, there was a series of 32, uh, verses lamenting, uh, Bacon's death. I think it was a, I, I believe it was a philosophical death. Uh, and yes, he did live out the rest of his days here in the colonies. Um, and so he states that, you know, in some future date, uh, someone would be able to unravel uh, the the depth and breadth of who Sir Francis Bacon really was. And um, I, I think that this plaque was a big part of that. He wanted there, is a, there is a theory out there that I've heard was that he did that because he did not want people to know that he was a playwright because he was doing other things for the crown. He thought that would that would hurt his career. Yeah, I was going to ask, why do you think he went to the trouble of all this? I mean, it's such a great question. Uh, that, that That's a big part of it, Jack. You know, um, yeah. And, and it's funny because, um, well, uh, Anthony Bacon and, and Francis were hanging around with that uh, theater crowd at the time and lady Anne uh, didn't approve of it very much and she wanted to know why they were wasting their time doing that um and so 
a part of it was that yes, uh, they were uh, members of uh, the intelligentsia, uh, the in intelligence crowd. Uh, they were collecting, uh, they were spying for Queen Elizabeth and uh, the second Earl of Essex, uh, Robert Devereux, um, and passing information along to him. Uh, and so, as such, you know, the, that the theory goes, like Jack just said, that, you know, that he wouldn't want to be associated with theater because that was something that was considered to be, you know, uh, a bad thing to be involved with. Um, the, here's the thing, though. Um, one of the things that I discovered, and this, again, this is speculation on my part. I want uh, the audience to know uh, that he didn't mind that his name, Francis Bacon, weren't on the place that it wasn't on the place uh, that he used the name William Shakespeare. Uh, the ciphertext explicitly state that yes, he used the name uh, and it, it, the word is, uh, was in Latin for the term legal name uh, of William Shakespeare. And that he even states that he was inspired by um, the AA symbol, which is uh, Apollo and Athena uh, as the spear shakers. And it says not you will. So he was saying, he was telling the actor, Will Shakespeare, that he was not the inspiration for the name, but Athena and Apollo were. Um, and here's the reason why. And again, this is speculation on my part. Um, Sir Francis Bacon was not his real name. Uh, it wasn't his real identity. Uh, he was living with adopted parents. Uh, and that's another one of the messages of the ciphertext uh, where he explicitly states who his real mother and father were. And then he was placed in the care of well, uh, the keeper of the seal for <laughs> Queen Elizabeth I um, and, and her best friend, Lady Anne Bacon. I mean, it makes perfect sense. Wow. So, so, that, so would be, that would be his, then that would be his, you know, in, and I was going to get to that too, is that in, uh, when you go out to um, uh, the ghost of bacon.com and you read that a little bit right at the very beginning, that's one of the questions or one of the things that you state there. What if the um, you're talking about his parents. Uh, what if the document also included the secret uh, Sir Francis Bacon's true parents and their names uh, of some of his aliases? So, or in the name of yeah. some of his aliases. So that's that's who his well, who were exactly who do you, who are you saying his parents were? Oh, uh, well, well, should I drag it out for Linda a little bit longer to just? Record <laughs> <you>? <laughs> yeah, uh, you wouldn't tell me. Sure, 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 I just, sure you like just that. put it on your show the other day, and I it's that's like no. <laughs> A myth. No. Uh, yeah. And again, you know, um, as I say this, you know, this is something that, you know, Bacon researchers uh, really don't like because there's something out there called the Prince Tudor theory. Mm -hmm. The idea that Sir Francis Bacon was actually Elizabeth I's secret son. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that's why he hid this, uh, the, the idea that, you know, he had uh, written the works of William Shakespeare and, and so on. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, um, he explicitly states that he is not, but he does say who is, and that and Robert Devereux, the second Earl of Essex, was Elizabeth's son. Uh, that's one of the messages directly from the ciphertext, uh, which in and of itself, that should please a lot of the Prince Tudor, Tudor theorists, because even though they were right about Robert Devereux, they were, they were wrong about Francis Bacon. His parents, however, um, were no less uh, auspicious uh, in the fact that uh, he actually had um, the heritage that would allow him, the, the first message that came up when I was de decrypting it states explicitly that he had basically the right to two different thrones uh, in two different countries. And he passed on holiday was the way he finished that, that statement. Hmm. So that could only mean one thing in my mind. And as I continued to decipher and suddenly the names came out, he was the son of Mary Queen of Scots and Francis II. Now, there are a lot of reasons, historically speaking, that people say that this can't be true. However, um, uh, the, the reasons given are, are not necessarily factually accurate. And so um, <laughs> there's one tradition out there where uh, it was stated that uh, Francis II could not have fathered children because his testicles hadn't dropped. Uh, you know, which as a young king, this sounds more like um, a disparaging comment from his jealous uncles um, than it does a, a, a medical diagnosis. And I, I don't really know uh, anywhere uh, or a kingdom where someone would have made such a disparaging comment unless, of course, he had died, which he had. Um, and yet the timeline fits perfectly. Um, you know, uh, Mary would have left 
uh, uh, left France when Francis was just over six months old. Now she had to negotiate. She was negotiate. She had to negotiate to come back to the islands, uh, Scotland and England, and, and, and Ireland. So um, she had to negotiate with Elizabeth the first. Now, think about this for a moment. Here you have um, Catherine de Medici, Francis II's mother, Francis Bacon's grandmother, um, who never liked Mary uh, for Francis. Uh, she despised her. And now all of a sudden, here's Mary, Queen of Scots, the Queen Regent of France, and her baby. So she, suddenly Mary would have been thrust in the position that, that Catherine de Medici had held for multiple years at that point. Now, anyone who knows anything about Catherine de' Medici and how ruthless she was uh, is not going to think for one second that she's going to say, oh, there's Francis III, my little grandchild. Oh, no, no, no. And she's not going to step down and let someone she despises take over the position she's enjoyed for so long. So all of it logically makes sense as well. Um, and so uh, Amias Paulette and uh, I believe it was Nicholas Throckmorton uh, were involved in the negotiations with Elizabeth uh, I uh, and Mary. And so um, what would have happened there? Suddenly you have uh, Mary Queen of Scots returning with an heir, something that Elizabeth I does not have and will not have. That is a direct threat to the throne of England. So here you have uh, two people uh, who were intent upon preserving their positions, Catherine de' Medici and Elizabeth I, who we know that when their um, uh, enemies were, were the same, that they would align uh, their interests together and, and coordinate with each other. Uh, this is something that is historically documented. Um, and so suddenly you have the, the winners uh, of this little saga writing history. And I think that's exactly what happened. And Francis Bacon wanted the truth to come out eventually that of his true identity and, and his birthright. Wow. So, you know, in, in, Saying a little bit about, you know, Shakespeare, you had mentioned that uh, his name and it was pronounced a little bit different. Uh, and it, was he a he was a state. Was he an actor, a stage actor that that was? Yes, uh, there, there was a Willem Shakespeare um, yeah. who was a stage actor. Uh, he uh, tried to at one point uh, corner the market in Barley yeah. and kind of got in trouble for that. Uh, he was um, for all intents and purposes. Uh, most people have have shown that. You know, he was basically illiterate and could barely sign his name. Uh, so he definitely did not have the education or access to uh, uh, what you would call court intrigues and uh, decorum and all of those kinds of things that that the person who wrote the plays of Shakespeare needed to understand and know. And Francis the Bacon, Francis Bacon, as the uh, unknown Dauphin of France and and uh, Prince of Scotland and England, uh, definitely would have. Uh, been well versed in all of those things. Right. And I was kind of thinking to myself about, you know, um, William Shakespeare that, I mean, I, I, I had assumed, and again, this is just an assumption based upon my ignorance of the man, but that he would have been in more of these, uh, he would have been in circles. He would have been somebody that would have been known in circles and they would have been talking to him about, Oh, you know, your writings and this and that, if that was, I mean, how does that play into this? It, it, exactly. There, there's, there is none of that evidence is really there. And yet you have contemporaries like uh, 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 Ben Johnson, for mm -hmm. example, who was very close friends with Francis Bacon and even lived in his home for some time. Um, these guys were good friends. Uh, there, there's a lot of there are a lot of things that are known about Ben Johnson as a contemporary uh, amongst other writers. Mm -hmm. And yet we we don't have any of that information about William Shakespeare. Uh, you know, it all just fits. Was he, was there now, and also there's, there's been talk, uh, that I've heard. And again, I, this is based on my ignorance here, these questions, yep. but was it, there, there's been talk that there may have been more than just Sir Francis Bacon that was doing writings using the name William Shakespeare. What, what, what does your research research show about yeah. that? Um, you know, my theory before I had ever even gotten involved in any of this, I always believed that, um, Francis Bacon and Ben Johnson and um, uh, Robert Devereux, second Earl, Earl of Essex, mm -hmm. uh, Robert Risley, um, uh, Southampton. Uh, all, all of these guys were, you know, within the same 
uh, group. And mm -hmm. I really believed that what they were doing was uh, writing plays in what's called in the round. And the way that works is that you have the real playwright sitting there and you get the actors up on stage and say, okay, guys, here's the situation improv it, act it out and do some improv. And what you, we're going to do is we're going to write down all the good bits. And then when, when you guys, you know, have all the good bits in there, and then what we're going to do is later on is shape it and, and have it, turn it into the poetry that we know today. I always believe that that's the way it works because you can produce a lot of a high volume of, of uh, plays in a mm. short amount of time by, by using that method. And, and who's to say that they didn't do some of that. Um, sense, but yeah. Yeah, you know, um, and that was always my belief that, you know, uh, uh, Bacon, Johnson, probably Anthony Bacon, all those guys were, you know, involved. That's what I thought. Uh, but as I did this research, you know, uh, Bacon explicitly, first of all, there there is no question whatsoever that Bacon was responsible for the creation of that plaque and that as the ciphertexts unfold in it, that he is the one who is sending these messages. Um, that's unequivocal. Uh, and he states explicitly that he used the name William Shakespeare and, and he, and he does it in two completely different ways. Now, uh, Jeff, Jack, uh, th this is the cool part of, of the cipher system on this plaque is that it has multiple, um, transposition ciphers. Okay. Uh, where you have multiple keys, uh, five different keys that will rearrange these characters in a completely new order each time. Okay. Mm -hmm. And. And in completely separate incarnations, you see the same messages or different messages about the same exact theme coming up. Mm -hmm. So one, uh, you know, key 32 produces the messages. Yes, I would, or key eight of key 32 says, I use the name William Shakespeare, um, you know, and, uh, and then in uh, a different key uh, of a five of, of 38, it says, um, I use, I was inspired for the name Shakespeare because of a, a, not you will, you know? So these messages keep coming up from completely different angles. And so in that sense, they, they, they repeat and, um, and it, it seems as though they, they, you know, uh, it can't be coincidence at that point. There's no, it's not possible. Right. As I keep trying to emphasize it in so many different ways, just to be very clear, I am the man, I am the man that does yeah. this. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, oh, Jack. Yeah. And I think that was, a, you know, a part of it, too. You know, if, if someone uh, looked at the plaque and said, oh, I bet I bet I can use the number 32 to rearrange these and they're going to get one set of messages. Right. Uh, that says that, you know, that message in a different form. And then someone else says, oh, I see how to use this key over here. Um, and then they use uh, use it and also they get a different set of messages. But with similar ideas. Um, one, and again, the main uh, message from beginning to end in, in every single one of these uh, transposition ciphers was the name of his parents over and over and over again. Wow. See, and that, that locks it in right there. I mean, there's no other way you can look at it at that point. If all yeah. the keys lead to that same conclusion or the same answer, um, then you can't look at it any other way. Absolutely. And one yeah. of the things that you had mentioned earlier that really set with me, and I and I I really applaud you for this, was that many of the things that you found out with these ciphers, you said were not, you were a little disappointed by the answers you got, or I don't know if that was the word you used, but you were surprised by the answers and maybe let down a little bit by the answers. And I like that because you were going into this with a completely open mind. You didn't have a predestined, oh, I wanted to say this. I want my ciphers to, to lead me to this conclusion. You went oh, yeah. into it with an open mind. Explain that a little bit. I mean, that's really interesting. Yeah, you know, for me, that was, you know, the, 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 the craziest part of this whole journey at this point, if I can use that cliche now. Uh, so many people use that that term though they've been on a journey but th th this is a, a journey i've tumbled down a rabbit hole that i wasn't planning mm -hmm. on um uh getting into and so yeah at, at first you know I, i've always been a fan of you know the prince tutor theory that i had mentioned earlier the idea that you know he here he was the illegitimate son of queen elizabeth or you know the the lower born son uh, mm -hmm. of uh, robert dudley for example um <clears throat> and that, you know, that was what led to his life of, of um, 
writing, you know, the plays in secret and all. I was really kind of hoping uh, to to see a message of that caliber. It, it, as far as having like a preconceived notion, that was one of them. Uh, the other one that I had was I was really hoping I would find a message about Oak Island. Um, and <clears throat> so when those things didn't happen, um, well, the Oak Island one did, but in a roundabout way, which was, <laughs> again, another part of the story. Yeah, we'll get to that in a little bit. We'll yeah. um, uh, but you know, yeah, you know, as I just, I said, well, you know what, I'm not, there, there's no way to really force the process. Right. Do you know what I mean? You, you just have to um, follow the standard operating procedure that I, and follow the rules um, that, you know, uh, crypt analysts use and, and just look at the clues and, and follow where they lead me. And that's what I did. And like I said, when I found out the message of, um, you know, Francis II and Mary Queen of Scots, I, I was dumbfounded. I was shocked. I was disappointed, I, I guess you could use. And the other thing that, that happened, I was scared. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Oh. You know, this, this is something that, um, you know, turns history on its head. Uh, and you know, the phrase that I use in the book is, you know, this has seemed way too big for a little hobbit here in the Shire. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's too big for me. Um, but like I said, you know, uh, I had to follow the truth where it led me. And um, and the, that that message kept coming through loud and clear. And so when that happened, I completely dismissed the whole notion that um, Oak Island was involved in any way, shape or form. And as a result, I actually uh, one whole transposition cipher went um basically un undecoded, if you will, undecrypted, uh, because I had such a, uh, at that point, I had a disconfirmation bias in my head of, I'm not going to look for anything for Oak Island, even though there was a context clue staring right at me. And I dismissed it because I felt that uh, the information was much, much larger than this, uh, well, that tiny island in the North Atlantic, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was that I, I read somewhere this thing was there for 400 years and nobody could figure it out what it said. Again, uh, yeah, yeah, we kind of talked about this during pre-show. It's such a great question, Jack. Um, that was one of, uh, actually, my brother-in-law asked me this question. He says, so no one else has ever figured this out, but all of a sudden you did? <laughs> the, way only, the way only a, a, a brother-in-law could could ask. Uh, it's like, really, you? Um, but here's the thing. Uh, I fully believe that other people have found the exact same messages I found. And... Um, one of the rules uh, uh, that are involved with uh, people who find themselves in what they believe are is uh, the fraternity of the Rosy Cross, for example, um, is when you suddenly discover uh, this, you know, secret uh, that you are under obligations to keep the secret, but you also have to celebrate it in a creative way. And um, that comes through in art, uh, I believe, in the works of Nicholas Poussin, for example. Oh, uh, fascinating. And, and others. Yep. Um, but it also happens in literature. There were multiple uh, uh, writers, uh, extremely famous writers, who, based upon the themes of their work, I believe, uh, full, fully understood uh, the background of the secret background of Francis Bacon and had unlocked the secrets of this plaque. And they would have been Alexander Dumas, who wrote uh, The Count of Monte Cristo and uh, The Man in the Iron Mask and other The Three Musketeers. Uh, uh, he uh, also, uh, Edgar Allan Poe was another one who definitely mm -hmm. understood what was going on there. Um, Sir Walter Scott, who often wrote about uh, these romantic tales of the lost Dauphin and um, you know the, the the prince who had lost his his uh, uh, kingdoms and so on. I, I think all of these guys were definitely in the know, and they they used those creative outlets and their literature and and artwork to to express those ideas. So um, you know, and that's my take on it. Uh, and so my approach was instead of doing it that way, I I'm I'm a fan of the truth first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that um, anytime something is, is, is uh, kept secret that it, particularly when it comes to, you know, a huge historical uh, discovery that, that that's a travesty that that's, that's a crime as far as I'm concerned. And I'm, I'm reminded of, of William Raleigh's um, 
uh, statement at, at the beginning of his his uh, opening of uh, the, the says to the reader of Manus Verulamiani, uh, the the collection of of verses about basically eulogies of, of Bacon's death, uh, where he says someday uh, someone will add to the fabric of of Bacon's true history. And I think that's what this is. And mm. um, so I, I, I felt I needed to be true to uh, the words of William Raleigh, for sure. Yep. And I think that, you know, you had mentioned about, you know, this this group of people that kind of understood what he was doing. And I, I, and I, and I tell you, sir, I think you're in that group as well. Um, <laughs> you know, for you to be able to figure this stuff out. I mean, I know that's, that's putting you up there, but it really, I mean, I could look at this all day long and, and, and I invite, if you have any of that that you'd like to show, because I, I know you've talked about it on, on some of your, um, that you've some, done some of your live uh, presentations that you've done. Um, sure. you know, and, and folks, I tell you, really, you, if you haven't gone out and seen those, um, I think are they available on on just on your um, the ghost of the ghost of bacon on the website or are they available on your YouTube or I'm sorry your Facebook page? The, the yeah, they're, they're available um, on all of those media, uh, Jeff. I um, the ghosts of bacon uh, I have uh, a gallery of, of all of my presentations there. Um, I also uh, my my YouTube channel, which is ghosts of bacon, and and um, same thing with my Facebook group. So they're available in each of those, those places. So you can right. find and, them. And folks, I tell you, really, if you haven't seen those, you really need to go check that out. If this kind of thing interests you, like it does me, uh, you really need to see that. And it's, it's a great, great explanation on YouTube. Yeah, exactly. Um, if, if you don't mind, could you have, uh, like the showing of the plaque and can you show us a little piece? Yeah, of that? Yeah. I, I can show you a little I, bit. I know I'm um, putting you on the spot there, no, but I, <laughs> that's fine. Um, Basically, what I can do is, you know, looking a, at this, as he mentioned, you know, as he's bringing that up, he mentioned about having the letters that are hooked together. And that's the thing that fascinates me. And, and you you know that it was not a mistake. Whoever penned this or, or made this, he didn't put an M and an E together as one letter by mistake. It meant something. And that's what he's getting ready to explain. And how, and, and then when you're talking about the reverse ciphers and things of that nature, it just... <sighs> Again, how you figure all that out, it blows me away. But go ahead. well, like I said uh, in the pre-show, I basically what I was able to do uh, was a result of time and focused attention. Mm -hmm. Re truly, you know, I, I I've been you know kind of a student of of um, you know Bacon ciphers for a while. Um, you know, I I love reading uh, uh, things like uh, Manly Palmer Hall, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, which actually talks a little bit about how to decrypt uh, Rosicrucian and Baconian ciphers a little bit and gives very subtle hints, I guess I'd say. He doesn't tell you how to do it, uh, but uh, the hints were were enough to get me started, and that's really what happened here. Um, I'll tell you what I'll do. Uh, Jeff, do you, wanna, do you want me to show you the plaque itself first? Uh, and then go into explaining uh, however, some however you'd like to do it, whatever is easiest for us uneducated like people. And I'm not talking about all of you members. There's probably many of you that are, are way ahead oh, of me yeah. on this whole thing. But <laughs> uh, however yes, you really want to do it. Yeah. if you share it, then I'll I'll have to uh, uh, you know let it you know you, once you share it, then I have to approve it, and then we can put it up. Sure. Okay. But, uh, yeah, this this stuff is fascinating. And like I said, there's probably a lot of you that understand this uh, maybe way more than I do. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so I can add the stream and it's showing basically it's showing us, I think, at the moment. Um, I don't know yep. if this okay, there uh, okay, there it is. There, yep, all right, perfect. So I'll, I'll just start with the message of the plaque, uh, Jeff. And okay. this is a, a small image of the plaque here. Uh, this is what we're talking about today. Um, and it starts right out saying, uh, you know, stay passenger, why goest thou by so fast? Read if thou canst, whom envious death hath placed within this monument, Shakespeare. Um, and so this read if thou canst is, a, is basically a call to adventure, if you will. It, it's telling you, hey, figure this out if you can. Um, if you can read this, you're going to know whose name is really in here. And that name is obviously Sir Francis Bacon, as I pointed out. But what I want to show you in the language itself of the plaque, it says... Um, Read if thou canst, whom envious death hath placed within this monument, Shakespeare. Um, and the colon follows the name Shakespeare. I'll show you a, a larger version of this here in a moment. But what that means is that Shakespeare is the monument. 
being talked about here in a symbolic sense. Okay. Um, Shakespeare is not the name that is in the monument. That's the, that's the important part to remember because the colon follows the name. It should, if it was saying that uh, the name Shakespeare was in the monument, uh, well, then the, uh, the colon would follow the mo the word monument instead of Shakespeare. All right. So obviously Francis Bacon is the name that I found and these conjoined and ligatured characters, I'm going to show you them here in a moment. This is what told me that there was a transposition cipher at work here and I needed to figure out how to set up an algorithm uh, to rearrange all of the letters. And so since Bacon's uh, simple reverse and uh, K ciphers are alphanumeric uh, ciphers, the uh, transposition ciphers usually produce anagrams. And so that's actually what happened. And Jeff, yeah, you mentioned this early on that steganography is, is the idea that you can hide messages in a surface text that would go unnoticed because it just looks like a, a little poem here. You know, right. it looks like a little verse dedicated to Shakespeare, uh, but under the surface is actually, you know, those ciphers. And so whenever in steganography, if you see errors or mistakes, those are always clues, uh, and they're usually in the area where you need to start looking. Um, and so in some cases, you have some oddly shaped characters. Uh, sometimes you have misspellings. Uh, and in this case, there was a mistake in Shakespeare's age down here at the bottom. Um, it says that he died at 53 when he was actually 52. Now, I do know uh, before any historians out there howl at me, um, you know, some people interpret um, Aetatis uh, as being in the year of, in other words, that he was in his 53rd year of life, even though he was 52. Um, I respectfully disagree because this is a mistake in his age and mistakes are clues. And they actually, since it's a transposition cipher, they needed a three in that exact location instead of a two. And that's why it's there. So here's the close up of it. And here's uh, the 53 I'm talking about here, uh, the mistake. And here you'll notice um, this monument. Notice the, this conjoined ME right here. Mm -hmm. and then the NT next to it. Um, this is the 153rd letter or character on this whole plaque. There are 305 characters in total. Uh, and th that counts um, all of these conjoined characters as one, okay? So um, the reason why they're conjoined is they're supposed to be moved as one character when you use the transposition, when you set up the algorithm. And in order for the count to work correctly, they had to have be together. And so um, 153 uh, is actually a, a simple cipher signature of the phrase, I, Sir Francis Bacon. And so, um, and there he is, me. Um, and same thing here, you have these letters here, uh, when you add them up in, in terms of how uh, each of these are numbered, uh, it ends up equaling 111. And that is the K cipher of Bacon. I'm going to go and show you what that means here in a moment. And so this basically spells out I-T-S, it's Bacon. Pretty funny. So <laughs> I'm going to switch gears here quickly and show you. Um, we'll talk about all of the different kinds of uh, ciphers uh, used by Francis Bacon. And as you mentioned, Jeff, uh, there were, you know, basically six of them. The first one is the bi um, bilateral cipher. And it's also called the biliteral cipher. Um, and this was the one that he created when he was 16 years old. And it's, wow. it's the, um, it's, it's what our binary computer language is based upon. So what he did was he would use two different fonts or typefaces and they would have subtle differences in them. And here you see an image of the very first word on the plaque, Judicio. And, um, the way it works is he groups these letters in groups of five characters. So these first five characters in Judicio all the way up to C would actually, based upon the differences in them, would actually equal um, a, a letter according to his key, okay? And so uh, in this, there is a biliteral cipher here, even though the, the, the typeface looks so crazy, um, the differences uh, between them were actually pretty simple to figure out. I figured that it had to be far simpler uh, than it appeared, and it was. Um, and the difference is, you see this I here at the beginning, how it's kind of curved and misshapen? Uh -huh. Yep. Well, the key, the key between noticing the difference between these two fonts is, is symmetry. And here you have the V, which is very straight, and you don't have any variation in the thickness. 
Okay. So the very, you know, uh, the symmetrical letters were the, his, his A alphabet and the curved ones with the variations were the B alphabet. And so when you have a B, A, and this was B, A, B, that letter is actually X <laughs> in oh, wow. his uh, little cipher. And what, what's weird is, um, which, you know, you never start out a word with the word, with the letter X. Uh, but as I continued, it actually phonetically spelled out the word explain RC keys. So it was kind of oh, cool. Wow. Um, and, it, and what it was, even when most people would see the letter X as the first letter, they think, oh, I messed up. No, no words start with the letter X. But I just followed the process and kept going and they revealed the message. It's kind of cool. Um, his simple reverse and case ciphers. These are alphanumerical uh, ciphers. This is where it's called a... Um, um, they call it a, a mathematical bijective function, which is a fancy word which sim simply means that you substitute numbers for the letters in the right. alphabet. All right. Yeah. And so simple is very, well, it's not just a fancy word, a uh, fancy name. It's simple where you assign uh, A to uh, as one and then Z is 24 because there are 24 letters in the Elizabethan right. cipher. Reverse is just the opposite of that where A is 24 and Z is one. K ciphers, is, I'll, I'll get into that in a minute, um, is, is really kind of interesting uh, because it actually, he created K cipher, I think, specifically to reveal his true identity as Francis III. So I, I think it just it blows my mind every time I think about it. Elizabethan short cipher is another one that he used. Uh, it's a, another very simple form, and it was, wasn't just one that he used, but a lot of people were using it. And lastly, is fourfold cipher, which is far more uh, complex than what I'm going to get into here today, but uh, this will definitely give you the basic idea of how it works. And like I said earlier, all of these uh, were actually used in conjunction with one another in order to uh, produce uh, ciphertext. So or did um, the first thing that... In the meantime, <laughs> they, they didn't want that to also them. happened. Jack. <laughs> Well, see, that's just it. If, if someone um, wasn't, like you said, a member of the club, right, uh, then they would look at it and just kind of roll their eyes and say, oh, there's nothing there. Uh, right. When in reality, it, it's staring in the face. So there are very specific things that are sort of the keys of the fraternity of the Rosy Cross uh, and, and bacon. Uh, there are signatures and, and numbers that keep coming up that when you see them in context, this is the important thing, is having a context. If you see the number 33 randomly somewhere, you can't just assume, oh, Francis Bacon is, is, is at work here. Um, there has to be a context for it. So uh, also you, here you see the AA symbol. This is from a, a headpiece uh, of the first folio. And here you see the A in light. And then here's the A in shadow. Mm -hmm. um, and that is uh, Apollo and Athena uh, being represented here as well as uh, the symbolism of light and shadow. So whenever you see this, um, it's, it's a signpost that says see or, or look at this because it means that, okay, you need to use your knowledge to look at what's being hidden here in the shadow. Um, another thing that ha uh, occurs frequently, particularly in the ciphertext on the plaque, is using just the letter C to represent the word C. Uh, that was used quite a bit. Um, a famous uh, symbol here for the uh, Rosicrucians, Freemasons, as, as well as Bacon is the triple tau symbol. Yeah. The initials TT stand for 33. But when we get into the fourfold cipher, uh, TTT, the triple tau, the value of that is actually 67, which is the cipher signature of the name Francis in simple cipher. This is how they all work together uh, interactingly, you know show you what that looks like. So the letters RC itself or, and the numbers uh, 70, uh, 173, for example, uh, represent RC. Uh, his biliteral cipher, which I just talked about, um, the end of that message uh, after I, I finished it was one of the mottos of the RC was Lux C Umbra, which I didn't know at the time, but uh, as, as I translated it from the Latin, it means light if shadow. So this is symbolic of, of Bacon's preferred uh, inductive reasoning, his form of logic that he used in his scientific method. All right, he, he was the creator of the scientific method. So he felt that you had to take an inductive reasoning. You take what you know and you apply it to what you don't know. So you light as a symbol of knowledge. Uh, you take your knowledge and you, if you something is in shadow, you have to take what you know and how you understand it in order to figure out what is, being un what is unknown. 
And that's really what's at work here uh, whenever we see these uh, signposts that there's probably a cipher at work here. So my work with the Shakespeare's plaque, uh, like I said, I, I just explained how I, 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 I as soon as I looked at it, I said, oh, this is a transposition cipher at work here. And as such, they produce acrostic an anagrams. Now, um, the problem with the anagrams is most people think that they're subjective. Uh, they're, they're not subjective at all. Uh, you have to use a standard operating procedure and just follow the clues where they lead you. And uh, that's what I did. And I, I kind of explained that process early on in the show. Um, and like I already explained what a mathematic bijective function is, and this is where you just simply uh, assign numbers to letters of the alphabet. And, and this function is definitely fulfilled by simple reverse and case ciphers, as you're going to see. Here's a, a famous acrostic um, in, uh, it's on page two of The Tempest, actually. And here you see F, B, A, C, O, N. F bacon. Um, and this is one of the examples of what an acrostic is. It's when you have uh, letters that will actually spell something out in a pattern mm -hmm. uh, in another text. And there were tons of these in the transpositions that I created. Uh, when I when I would use a key to create a transposition and reorganize letters, suddenly there were these kinds of acrostics popping out everywhere. And so that told me that I, I had selected the correct key and I, I was using the right process. Um, so the messages appeared in phonetic and those acrostics and anagrams and well as acrostic anagrams. Now, the acrostic anagrams where all of these letters were very conjoined with each other in a pattern and they spelled out a word. So um, using simple reverse and K ciphers is what uh, allowed me to understand what was really going on. Something else that um, I hadn't realized uh, that I discovered while I was doing this whole you know, thing was that there is a substitution system between simple and reverse ciphers. And this is something it, it goes back thousands of years. It's called an atbash cipher and it goes back to the Hebrew alphabet. And I'll explain how that works here in a moment. So using this in conjunction with what are called cipher signatures, I'll show you here on the next couple of slides. Um, this is what indicates that Francis Bacon was the one behind all of this. And so the way a si signature works is you take say the name Bacon, and by adding up the values of each letter, uh, for example, bacon in simple cipher, you add up all the values of each of those letters and it equals the number 33. So the number 33 is a cipher signature of bacon in simple mm -hmm. cipher. Uh, same thing with Francis, it's 67 when you add up those letters. So 67 is the cipher signature of Francis. And what's really interesting is that in simple cipher, it's it's a octave relationship. It's, it's a, a, a two to one relationship, you know, a 33 and 67 equaling 100. Uh, so his whole name, uh, Francis Bacon equals 100. Pretty interesting. And so here you see, these are the common signatures that most people are familiar with, with Shakespeare uh, in simple cipher, you add up those letters and you have one, 103 and reverse cipher. Uh, with, with um, you know, Z being A, or Z being one, excuse me, and, and A being 24 adds up to 172, and the K cipher produces, you know, 259. And here you see all these other values. Uh, Francis Bacon, these are the most famous values of 67, 108, and 177 for Francis, and 33, 92, and 111 for Bacon. And then, of course, you know, uh, these numbers become significant when we're dealing with... Uh, the fraternity of the rosy cross all right there was one question that popped up real quick i know we're getting far past that now but one question that uh, alessandra nadavari had asked about the one picture with the two a's in it and she asked about where is the the triple tau in there um i is that in that picture oh no the triple tau doesn't appear in that picture at all okay okay by, by the way hi alessandra <laughs> glad you could make it um yeah uh triple tau will, will come up here momentarily but I, um that I can show you uh, an example of that on a picture of the plaque here at the end. Okay. Um, sure. So here in simple cipher, this is the way it works here. You have a rep, uh, being represented by the number one and then Z to 24. Mm -hmm. And I've in bold, I have the letters that make up bacon. And so you can see when you add them up that they equal 33 in simple cipher. So that again, you know, that's just, um, mm -hmm. the basics of how simple cipher works. Same thing with the reverse cipher. Here you have the same letters being highlighted, but now A is 24 and Z is one. So it's the same thing, only just reversed, not a clever name. And uh, 
here you see you add up these characters and that's how bacon uh is 92 in reverse cipher here is uh the substitution sim uh, system between simple and reverse that I discovered that Bacon was using on the plaque. And again, it's based upon the at bash system. And you have this, I set up this table exactly the same way that um, uh, scholars of the Talmud would have uh, back in ancient times. And only with the, with the uh, Elizabethan alphabet. And so here you can see that A can, um, in both of those ciphers, it either equals one or 24. Same thing as Z. So these letters in this cipher system could actually be substituted with each other. And it works throughout this entire alphabet, wow. L's, O's, and, and so on. Um, so what this did, I realized it, it, it gave Bacon a lot of flexibility when he was yeah, uh, sure. in, in, encrypting his, his, his message. Uh, it made things a little confusing for me, but as soon as I um, realized that this was happening, everything just kind of unfolded and I could read it. Uh, right. You know, kind of like what I was saying in in, in the pre-show is a you you immerse yourself in this stuff for over a year and a half, and it, it's like a language. You, know, you become fluent in it. Um, and like I said, uh, this is based upon the substitution uh, system of the Atbash cipher from the Hebrew Torah. Um, there's a really famous example of this in the Book of Jeremiah. Um, they, they use the name Shishak in two different places, spelled in the original Hebrew. And what they they couldn't figure out what this meant. They knew uh, it was a, a place name, but it was um, once they realized there was an atbash substitution going on, uh, all of these guys they were really kind of confused. Once they figured that out, they realized it's a place name, and it actually named uh, Babel. Oh wow! Yeah, and so when they figured wow. this out, they said, oh, this unlocks a bunch of uh, you know uh, mysteries that we had never uh, been able to understand before. And so once they realized that uh, this was a thing, and again, it goes back thousands of years. Uh, and, and so there's definitely um, a precedent for it. Uh, and since uh, Bacon used a lot of um, uh, ancient Hebrew uh, and um, a lot of the symbolism, for, for example, of the tree of life symbol mm -hmm. um, and uh, Kabbalah, um, you know, for the Rosicrucians, it made perfect sense that he would have used this as well. So, case did you, ever, did you ever find that you, when you were working on this, that you would just come to a blank and walk away from a half hour and then come back and go, there it is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, Jack, sounds, yeah. I know it sounds like a dumb question, but it's not. It's not a dumb question at all. I, that definitely happened multiple times. Um, and, and usually when I would walk away, it was to go to the fridge, crack open a beer. <laughs> you know, like, I need to take a break here. Yeah. Uh, exactly. but, but you're right. You know, it, it, it allowed me to kind of uh, clean out the cobwebs a little bit come back with fresh eyes and and see what was really there and yeah it suddenly I, I would look at it and i'd say oh geez how did i miss that and it you know so yeah that was a big part of the process for sure so getting back k cipher uh, this is the one that confuses people because a all of a sudden is 27 and it go it actually starts at k the letter k at 10 which is the same as simple cipher all right and goes to z to 24 but what bacon did was he added the ampersand and the word et, which both mean and, um, as characters 25 and 26, and then A starts over again at 27. Now, my first uh, inclination was, I suspected that he wanted the letter G uh, to be represented by the number 33, which is, you know, bacon and simple cipher. And even though that works, and, and, and I think that is a part of it, um, I think there's more to it than just that. Because when we take those our letters here of bacon and it totals 111 well what that does if we put the word francis in front of 111 it actually tells his true identity which is francis the third oh wow i suspect that that was one of his main motivations wow. uh, of adding these these nulls here um within k cipher and again know. That fascinates me that you were able to figure that out. I have that this one here, the others, the the, the simple cipher and the reserve and the reversed. Reverse. I see, but but looking at this one here is like, well, okay, <laughs> well, right, right. Yeah, this is the one that confuses most people because yep. everyone says, well, why would he, you know, add in these null characters? Mm -hmm. And like I said, you know, I, again, you know, I I'm 
basing this conjecture, and it is conjecture, uh, on my reading of the ciphertexts that reveal themselves in the plaque. And so now that I know his true identity, uh, it makes perfect sense that he right. would have the name Francis and then three ones after it. He was Francis the third. Yep. Wow. So Elizabethan short cipher, um, this is how that works. You take the alphabet and you simply write it in the table um, under the numbers one through nine. And basically you have all of these letters share the same value. And so here, if we add Francis Bacon together, this is where we get the, uh, the message of 55. Okay. This is where his, his, um, so basically there are three, uh, cipher, uh, signatures, 33. And then his secret one was 44, which is mm -hmm. actually, um, uh, the simple uh, value in simple cipher of the word Rex, which is Latin for king, and which is why it's a secret cipher, along with a couple of other very good reasons. Uh, but that's the easiest one. Um, and then 55 here in Elizabethan short cipher. So 33, 44, and 55 uh, were all being used by him. So here's a picture of the fourfold cipher. It, it's the best that I could actually produce it here on the screen uh, for your viewers. Um, fourfold cipher, all it is, we take the simple cipher. If you remember a is one and then Z is 24. Mm -hmm. And what you do is you string four of these end to end, and then you just continue the numbering. So a, but at the same time, you're, uh, doubling, tripling, and quadrupling the letters here. You see the fourfold is, is the end in between here would be twofold, which would be a, a equaling 24. Right. And, and then you have a, 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 and then you have the quadruple A, which is 73, and the quadruple Z is 96. Um, and so what you could do is when you have a phrase or a name, suppose that has, um, that has, uh, you know, the, the same letter appearing in it multiple times, instead of totaling them using simple cipher or reverse cipher, instead you take those doubles or if you have three or four A's all in the same name, all four of those, instead of equaling the number four, suddenly they equal 73 here. So that produces a whole different host of, of numbers and signatures. Uh, consequently, I didn't include it on this image, but um, in the triple fold, um, A, A, A through Z, 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 uh, the triple tau, the value in that, is 67 for Francis, yep. uh, which is also a reason why, um, interestingly, that just the letter T can represent uh, the name Francis because uh, 67 is also the 19th uh, prime number. And as such, um, it represents Francis in, in simple cipher, but 19 is the letter T in simple cipher, as you see here. Kind of cool. So here's an example of using fourfold cipher. Uh, this is something I discovered when I was uh, really digging into Francis Bacon and his background. Um, and I just mentioned how the triple tau represents uh, 67 and so on. The quadruple T is 91 on that last screen, you'll notice. And that is actually Anthony in simple cipher. And so um, Francis and Anthony used to sign some of their letters to each other, T, 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 and, and quadruple T. Um, here you have um, a famous painter, artist, Nicholas Hilliard. He was famous for uh, painting the miniature of Sir Francis Bacon, as well as multiple miniatures of Elizabeth I, and everyone who is associated with the true secret identity of Francis Bacon. And when you look at the self-portrait of Nicholas Hilliard and the miniature he did of Bacon, and you look at them side by side, you can tell they're the same person. Um, so Francis Bacon was an artist. And so here is a signature on one of his paintings that he did of his, his wife. Uh, and here you can see that there are actually four A's in here. It was supposed to be an H with an N in it. But notice there's another N that goes backwards. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. So it's supposed to stand for Nicholas Hilliard. Makes sense. But why is there another N? going backwards. Well, it produces four A's. Here you have one A, right? Mm -hmm. And then you here you have the other A. And then they are also upside down too, where you have one A here and the other A here. 
with a crossbar there. So there are four A's. So then just looking at this signature, we can say, well, okay, that equals 73. And with the H, what you actually have there, uh, H is often used, particularly in the um, in the ciphertext, as a double tau. So it can either equal um, 38, or in this case, because of TT in the fourfold uh, cipher, its value is 43. So this H is actually two T's with their stem conjoined. Wow. And then lastly, you have the forwards N and the backwards N. So we add all those up and it equals 153, which is the cipher signature of the, the name King Bacon in reverse cipher, uh, along with a, a few others as well, like I Sir Francis Bacon. But back when he was uh, did this particular portrait, uh, he hadn't been uh, knighted yet as Sir Francis Bacon. So I'm assuming he was working under the observation of, or basically telling people he was King Bacon. Mm -hmm. um, you can also add in an X here, right? And so uh, that totals, now you add all of those together and it's 175, which is the cipher signature in both simple and reverse of Francois Stewart, which would have been one of his true names and true identity. Um, if you want to continue, we can add on an M here and a W, which added together are 33, which we know is bacon and simple cipher. Uh, we add it all together and it's 208, which is actually Francois Stewart III in simple cipher and Francois Stewart in fourfold. Wow. How have we figured that out? It just blows me away how he was yeah. putting that all together. It's like, <laughs> you know, that, that, that's what I'm saying. It's, that's it's that like, mind working like that. I just can't, my mind just doesn't work like that. <laughs> I know. And, and it's so you, it, it, it just, the more I uh, get into this, I, I just, I keep finding more and more and more. And I realized none of it, none of it could be a coincidence. No, and particularly if not. you, if you take out, um, if you're, uh, some people would be uh, skeptical perhaps of using H as a double tau. And if we subtract the double tau value and instead use H, the total is 173. 17 is the letter R and three is the letter C, RC. So that's that's just one example of how the fourfold. Yeah, you're system. definitely part of that group. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not. I'm, I'm not. You're oh. definitely part of that group to be able to figure that out. That's amazing. So wow. um, here you go. I'll stop the screen share. But uh, you know, and that's again, guys. That's the tip of the iceberg of some of the stuff that I've found. Um, and you know, the more I, I dug into Nicholas Hilliard. Um, he was uh, really instrumental. And once I started understanding that um, he was an obvious um, uh, alias of, of Sir Francis Bacon, mm -hmm. uh, all of, when, when, you, when you do the uh, totals for his names and all of the different ciphers, it just keeps coming up as the Dauphin and, and King Bacon and all of these different things. Um, so um, I felt that he was probably one of his very first aliases that he used. Mm -hmm. and, and, and he became far more subtle in, in terms of how he crafted them later on. Uh, but um, that, that was, all, I did a whole presentation on just Nicholas Hilliard alone uh, because there's just so much there. It's so much more than what I've been telling you. We've got, uh, we've actually got a caller. Um, I oh. believe this is Julie. Julie, are you there on the line? Uh oh, hold on just a second. I can barely hear you. What's going on here? Hold on. Uh, no, let me see if it's on my end here. I'm going to try to turn you up. All right, say something now. No, it's still coming through really quiet. Hold on a second. Um, so how many, he had what, six aliases? Oh, gosh. Um, I've been able to unravel five at this point. Wow. Um, but there, there were far more than that. Uh, th again, it's just the tip of the iceberg. A, a couple of them were are actually okay. very famous people. So, all right, I think I have it now. Julie, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. There we go. There you are. This is this is yeah. Julie Clark. She called in. She's got some questions, and she had several. So I thought it might just be easier to have her call in to ask these questions for you. Awesome! I love it. I hope I have answers. <laughs> Hi, well, Julie. You've, you've answered quite a lot of them already. Oh, good. <laughs> um, one of the things that um, did jump out at me is when you were going through all of the different cipher methods, but it, it sort of relates to a question I've got anyway, is whether 
you feel that Bacon was the man in his own right? Did he do? Did he? Is he responsible for everything, or does he have any um, like-minded friends? Is how I'd like to put it that are involved too, because one of the codes you use actually has a meaning for one of the other people. So, um, okay. for example, one of the leading. Um, candidates for Shakespeare, and I don't believe it was one person, I believe it was several, um, is um, the Earl of Oxford. And where you've got M and W together, um, that can represent 17 and 40, meaning the Earl of Oxford. So I wondered whether you had come across anybody involved in your travels. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'm I'm curious, uh, they could be, did you say that M and W could be 17 and 14? Sorry, the, the M is normally actually connected. Um, the M is 12 because it's a Hebrew mem. Right. Um, so it, it comes out as, as a 12 and then you add the 12 to a, a 5 normally, which is um, an E to get your 17, 17 being the 17th Earl of Oxford. And 14 oh, okay. being his... He code for his name. His name was Devere, so he used two V's. Two V's are yeah. forty, so he used both of those as code for his name. I get it. Okay, I I, I follow you now. Um, yeah, you know, um, that's one of the things that I've I've noticed throughout this all of this work, and it's such a great question. Uh, thanks for that, Julie. Uh, you know. When one of the big things I was kind of hoping I'd find would be more information on uh, Devere in particular, um, and. And I, I haven't found anything. Um, and I've always been of the, of the same mindset as you, that uh, I always believed that it was more than just one person. Um, and yet you know, what I found uh, from these cipher texts is that uh, Bacon makes the statement that, you know, he used the name Shakespeare. Um, now, uh, that does not preclude that he didn't have help. Uh, he, does, he doesn't say that he had help. Uh, but, uh, I, I would leave that open as a definite possibility. Um, and yeah, you know, a lot of the candidates of, of who, you know, have, have been put, uh, put out there as, as being, uh, possible examples of, of candidates of Shakespeare, uh, Devere is one, uh, uh, I've even heard Robert Devereux and even, uh, uh, Sir Walter Raleigh, uh, whose name also comes up in the mm-hmm. cypher, by the way. Um, and so, um, the only answer I can really give you is no, I, I didn't see anything with Devere specifically. And uh, I, all I saw was um, that he explicitly states that he was the one who used the name Shakespeare. So uh, I, I hope that's a question, a answer to your question. <laughs> I wish I could, I wish I yeah, had more. No, one, one of the theories that I've actually thought um, of is that there's two layers. There appears to be more than one layer within Shakespeare. Mm, um, and that there were two layers in most of the coding, one relating to Bacon, perhaps, and one relating to De Beer. Because recently, very recently, Alexander War has um, translated the, the same um, monument, yeah. and it relates. It, he, he can pull out that De Beer is the key. So there are clear references to both of them. And I felt that the double A may be reference to two people, two sides to the same person. Um, yeah, so that, that's, um, that's rather than great. it just being one person specifically, it was actually the combination of the two coming together. And um, so Jonathan Bates, who is um, at Oxford University, who's a Shakespeare scholar, he definitely has sort of said that there is nothing else like Shakespeare. And is that the reason why? Because there's the two of them coming together rather than individually. I think that's a fascinating theory. Uh, I love it. Um, And it also reminds me of of Peter Dawkins' work. Um, Are you familiar with that? Yeah. Yeah. He he has the, uh, his, his Gemini theory uh, of, of Bacon and and Shakespeare. Um, And I, Basically, throughout this whole process, I have suspected that there is more to that than just, um, you know, Bacon using the AA to represent himself and Shakespeare when Shakespeare was just one of of the aliases that that is encoded in the, in the cipher texts. Um, and uh, going along with what you also said, uh, I can say one hundred percent 
um, that there are multiple uh, layers to the ciphertext themselves. Uh, I've, I've uncovered them. Uh, so so I, I agree with you 100% um, that, that that's definitely a possibility because it, it, it's not just a possibility, it, it's, it's real. <laughs> so um, thank you for that. Um, but uh, like I said, uh, I would love to look at uh, the information you just mentioned because um, I, I really, really uh, like that be uh, the whole theory simply because this, this, um, there is a twin component here uh, that I've been working on in the next book uh, that I've been um, basically uh, making notes on for <laughs> what my next project, I guess I'll put it that way. Uh, and that is definitely an aspect of it that I want to get into. So I, I would love for you to uh, um, uh, share more of that information with me if you could, because um, it, I, I'm seeing a lot of the same ideas. Because from what I've seen, I think that Bacon is the chap in the dark. And Devere is the chap in the light. Oh. I, you know, it, it's funny. Um, Devere was not on my radar, but I had a different candidate for the one being in the light. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I, I could say that much. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I also uh, agree. I, I thought that Bacon was the one in the shadow for sure. Yeah, I agree with that. Right. So, so here's the, the, the nitty gritty question. Why okay. did Bacon choose Oak Island? Uh, it, well, I, I don't think he chose it. I think it was chosen for him. Um, it's such a good question. Okay. Uh, Oak Island, um, as it turns out, um, and Jeff was, uh, we were talking about how we were going to kind of get into this eventually anyway. So, this could mm -hmm. be the perfect segue for yeah, it. Good segue right uh, into it. Right into it. One of the, um, cipher texts and then there were um <clears throat> there is an acrostic uh, like i had just mentioned in what is called key 32 uh, that states explicitly um rosy map maker and it, and it goes in a counterclockwise position or a clockwise position it spells out rosy map map maker and so it really draw uh, obviously attracted my attention and when I um, looked more closely, I discovered an acrostic anagram that spells out the name uh, Samuel de Champlain. So this indicates that uh, he was at least a member of the Rosy Cross. Now, um, wh what that does is that led me to a map that actually leads directly to Oak Island. Okay, uh, so there are there are multiple messages that led to that map and that map then led me to Oak Island that much. I'm allowed to say at this point. Um, and so what I, one of the elements of it was it names an Island um, as, and, and what that name of the Island indicated to me was that it was an Island that has been used for a very long time, uh, most recently by privateers, okay, particularly uh, Danish privateers, but they would have been in used in association with also Francis Drake uh, when he was, you know, uh, attacking the Spanish, and, and uh, of course the Danes were helping him as well. Um, <clears throat> so all of these things interrelated indicated to me that that Oak Island has, was just a spit of an island that was used uh, from the times of of the Templars that with mariners, experts who were uh, capable of pinpointing a part of the world from the other side of the world, okay, using three-dimensional geometry, um, that they, they were all in the know, okay, that, okay, if you need a place to hide something, we have this out-of-the-way little island that looks in inconspicuous, and this is the one we use, okay? Um, and... It, it, it sounds sounds crazy, but if if I um, hadn't found this particular, um, well, these dots connected in that way, if that makes sense, I, I wish I could tell you more, but it actually has to do with uh, a current theory that I'm that I have now um, uh, sent to the guys on Oak Island, so I, I can't get into it too much. Um, but but yeah, yeah, there there is there there is a way to co to connect those dots if that's what you're asking. 
Okay. Well, my last my last question <laughs> before I <laughs> leave you is: Good keep coming. It's great. Do you think the treasure is? <laughs> so, what what would Bacon's treasure be on Oak Island? Um. Well. Uh, <laughs> Again, that was a part of my presentation that I gave. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I. Those NDAs I do come into play, don't they? Yeah, the NDA uh, has has uh, my tongue tied here, but um, I, I can say that yes, the ciphertexts do explicitly state uh, what he claims, or what the ciphertext claim uh, would be left there on Oak Island, and how to find it. Um, and so it, that was the basis of my, my presentation uh, last season, uh, last September. Okay. So, yeah, I, I, I really wish I could share with you, share more with you, but um, I, I, I was able to put um, um, all of that in my book as well. So in that, in that form, I, I do have the information out there for anyone who is interested. Wow. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks very much. I'm, I'm going to continue to listen. Uh, thanks right. very much and thank bye you, everybody take care yeah thank you for calling thank in you. appreciate bye. it great questions great question uh, thanks Julie uh, that was really great yeah I, and it's like uh, once again you know we were talking earlier Jeff um, about what I was hoping <laughs> I would discover versus what I did mm -hmm. and she, you know, she hit the nail on the head. Exactly what I was kind of hoping I would see is okay. I've always had the theory that they were wit written in the round, and you know, who would have been involved? You know, are, am I going to find their names? And I didn't find any of them. Uh, <laughs> there was another question that was asked. Um, let's see, uh, the Awoken one uh, on over on the uh, YouTube side asked this question here. Uh, as interesting as it is, would Francis Bacon really have used such ciphers to code his messages, knowing that the other scholars of his time would have easily been able to decipher his messages? Oh, absolutely, yes. Un unequivocally, Awoken One, yes, he would have done that. Um, and it, it wasn't necessarily that um, all of the... Uh, other scholars of his time would have been able to, the people that he was in contact with would have been able to. Um, and so, so yeah, he, there, there's no doubt that he would have used all of these ciphers because um, in documented history, there, there are records of him using all of them. And so, um, you know, that's, it, it's the idea that um, the people that he trusted with uh, this information they understood the import of it because um, it would have upset the entire order, the social order of Europe. When suddenly you have uh, the heir to the French throne as well as the British throne, um, that, that throws everything sideways. And um, first and foremost, Bacon was a patriot and he would not have done anything that would have uh, placed his country in turmoil or uh, any of those kinds of things. So, yeah. I mean, it, I, I understand, I understand where the question's coming from, but uh, no, I, I may have misspoke, misspoken myself earlier. Maybe that's uh, what caused it. Um, that the idea of the scholars of his time, what I meant was his contemporaries with whom he was in continual contact with, you know, we're, we're talking about, um, you know, uh, the astronomers uh, in in Germany and in France, Italy, and so on. A small select group that went out of there would know exactly what he was talking about. Oh yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. And and I, I think that uh, many of them were um, <clears throat> were involved in uh, writing those uh, eulogies in Manus Fernandiani as well. One of the uh, one of the things, and it and it fascinates me because you know one I we, we didn't really put together initially that Sir Francis Bacon could have come over and been in uh, the New World or in Nova Scotia. And and I think that um, there may be some new light being shed on this that obviously you're working on. Yeah. Um, you know, and it was and this was kind of shared with me with a viewer um, or a member of our group. Um, and she said that according to some historians, um, Sir Francis Bacon came uh, to the Newfoundland and possibly to the Nova Scotia area. Um, and then since sailing into, um, I guess it's, it's M I N A S minus M minus basin. Um, 
Mm -hmm. then, then it could have been a very short hop over to new Ross. It could have happened. Um, and, and again, this is all just kind of conjecture, but, um, you know, there, as the Mi'kmaq people, uh, talk about a, you know, and the question was, is there a chance that the King that the natives encountered was Sir Francis Bacon? Um, and if he was looking to be, you said he was a, you know, he was a King or he had that Kingship was in his right. Right. And, and, but he decided not to. Was it his decision, do you think, that to not be a king or didn't take that position? Well, I, I, Over there. Again, I think it's way more complicated than that. But um, in a sense, yes, Jeff. But I think that he, um, well, again, some of the cycles. <laughs> I know we're probably touching on that too much. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. It's fine. I'm, I'm finding a way around it. Um, basically, uh, to answer the initial question, could the king that the Micmac have, have met could they have been Francis Bacon? Yes, I, I think so. Um, can I place uh, Sir Francis Bacon in New France? Yes. Um, and again, um, you know, this is something that uh, he was very explicit about in terms of, of those uh, messages in the ciphertext. And you also have to understand that since he had access to both France and England, um, he had two different avenues uh, that he could use to uh, pursue his goal, which was, I think, to retire here in the colonies. And I, uh, my my work uh, indicates that that's exactly what he did. Uh, he <clears throat> experienced a philosophical death, um, you know, at the age of sixty-five, and uh, lived out the remainder of his days uh, actually in Canada. So. Wow. See, now that's, that's, that's fascinating because, um, you know, and that's, and that's the thing because we have, you know, a, 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 as well, as you well know already, if you're familiar with Alessandra Nadavari, um, <laughs> and she has, she has been on my show a couple of times. She's helped me with uh, co-hosting before. Um, and she has a very fascinating piece of property, uh, in new Ross. And so, you know, that, it, it, you know, and I'm, and I'm thinking, Man, it wouldn't if he was there. If he was in Nova Scotia um, and around Oak Island, it's not that far away to New Ross. And knowing that there's a foundation there um, that is yet uncovered, uh, and also with the the town, the, you know the um, the Charing. I think it's pronounced Charing Cross. Uh, yes. The the part of the you know it it just. I, I just wonder, you know, how is he or could he be connected to all of that? That's that's. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I, I I feel the same way about that. Um, I've always been fascinated with um, Alessandra's uh, property, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, uh, many of us uh, uh, theorists and researchers have <clears throat> found indications that basically uh, point directly from Oak Island to <laughs> the new Ross Castle, mm -hmm. uh, in, in multiple ways. Uh, uh, my own theory included, um, and so you know. Basically, the information contained in the messages of the ciphertext. Uh, I, I said at the beginning, um, it's it's daunting because it, it it's so jarring in, in terms of what we already think we know about mm -hmm. history, and and yet um, there, what it revealed to me through this whole process, and part of the reason why I had intimated to you guys that it, that it was scary. Um, is it, it made me realize uh, how little we really do know about our recorded history, uh, frankly. And so it, it is through these, um, you know, uh, examples of hidden writing uh, that suddenly uh, you, you see these messages appear and announcements appear that are just so, well, they're so counterintuitive and, and, and seem impossible that, um, you know, I really hesitated to, to include them in the book, but unfortunately I, I had to, you know, like I said, I, I followed the clues where they led me. And, um, and when people actually read about how Bacon found himself here in the Americas, um, uh, it, I, I, I think they're going to be shocked. And it's, it's one of those things where people, you know, I would preface it with, okay, listen, you're not going to believe this, but, <laughs> and when I say you're not going to believe this, I mean, you, you're really not going to believe it. Um, it, it, it doesn't seem possible, but yet that's what the message is stated. So I, I wish I could, I wish I could share more. I know. 
I know it. Season nine. I, season nine. Season nine. <laughs> Maybe next year at the same time I can come on and. Uh, <laughs> and, and yeah, I tell you what, well, when you're on, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna we're probably you to that also. Yeah, we're gonna Good. we're gonna have you on, and we're gonna be talking about that for sure. Um, um, you know, there's there's we were talking, and this is something that I kind of brought up, uh, you know, earlier, um, you know, talking about the the Mason marks, and you know, <laughs> those were very very interesting. Um. And I, I was just reading a, reading a text here. Um, <laughs> uh, so there was that bit, little bit that I read to you about the Mason marks in old churches, and it and it was yeah. in this appendix that I have here in front of me says that Sir Bank Sir Francis Bacon and his secret society states that when Rosicrucian when a Rosicrucian died. Um, they were to be quietly and uh, buried very simply. And there was not to be any kind of fanfare. There was maybe not even a tombstone. There was uh, no markings on it. And if anybody did, uh, if he had some friends or something that wanted to have a monument in his honor, that the inscription would be ambiguous. Um, and I know that recently, you know, the, the folks on uh, Oak Island found that bag seal. Um, and there is some different things about this that kind of connect together with um, these, these Rosicrucians and their symbols, these uh, Mason marks that they're called in old churches. Now, this is from, a, this is from a, uh, 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 an article that was written in 1893, but, and I have a picture here of some of them, and I showed this to you earlier, and I wanted to bring it up just to kind of show folks and kind of get your thoughts on this. I'm going to share the screen just for a moment. Um, and it's, I, it, it, if, if you look at the, the very first one, and I'm going to bring this up here, the very first one on the top left, number 46. Now, folks, you've that watched the, the ending of the Curse of Oak Island, the last couple episodes there, and you saw that bag seal. Uh, take a look at number 46 up there on the top left um, and tell me that we haven't seen something very similar to that uh, very recently. Um, you know, so there's also the one down in the lower right, number 60, um, that, uh, is again, has that four and the cross and then the X's, or maybe they were, um, V's upside down for, up, you know, forward and then upside down V's, uh, you know, right here on the very bottom. It's, I mean, again, it's interesting stuff and knowing that, um, you know, Sir Francis Bacon and his secret society. What, 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 I guess, the, I guess the question I wanted to know from you was, and, and I, and again, this is from my ignorance from all of this kind of stuff. And I'm just learning. I'm on the, I'm, I, I'm like the, the student that's just came into the class <laughs> and I'm trying I, to I understand this. I've been there. <laughs> oh. You know, so obviously he was, was Sir Francis Bacon a Rosicrucian? Um, he was the Rosicrucian. The Rosicrucian. Opinion. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. In my opinion, that's so that's something it. like this would connect to him in some way. It, it very well could. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Possibly. Right. I find, I find the symbol that, that you put up there very, very interesting. Um, uh, the double X is something that appears um, in a couple of other places in my research. Uh, and as such, I mean, it makes sense considering the fact that X in simple cipher is 22. And if you double it, it's 44, his secret signature, which means Rex. Um, and so, you know, it's something that I've seen over and over again. So it doesn't really surprise me to see it there. Um, and so again, you know, I, I wish there was, um, yes, it is a Mason symbol. Uh, there, there was another, um, um, message for the ciphertext that I did not include in my book. Um, and uh, I'm basically saving it for uh, probably the, uh, my next project. Uh, but there, there seems to be an indication that uh, Bacon stated that uh, his uh, famous fraternity, RC, uh, evolved into Freemasonry. And so... Um, and yeah, it, 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 it again, a lot of the symbolism is, is being reused and repurposed. And yes, the double X is also uh, used in uh, 
the Templar cipher. It is. Uh, additionally, you have um, the double X is also a stylized double cross uh, mm-hmm. that was used, and it's where we get the term double cross today. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's all interconnected for sure. Yeah, and that's going to be interesting to see what uh, um, you know what comes of this. I, I cannot wait to find out. Uh, you know, you, and, and again, I know we can't talk about it right now, but I tell you what, I cannot wait to find out what new research you have into this. This is going to be um, uh, very, very interesting. And I think that uh, one of the things that, and I've said this before on the show, um, that it is very important to me. And I know it is to Rick Lagina. He's talked about it many times to know that who, what, why, when, and where. Yep. That history that he is uncovering here, trying to uncover and hopefully will uncover, yeah, could change the history of North America. Our history books could get rewritten by all of this. Oh, yeah. And, and I, I think in a lot of ways it already has. And it, mm-hmm. it is due to the show, The Curse of Oak Island. Um, right. You know, the, the idea of, you know, finding you know, shoe leather <laughs> that far underground yes. or the, the idea of, of there being, you know, the U shaped structure, which I believe was an original coffer dam, mm-hmm. uh, right. you know, and the days right. that they're, and the days that they're giving with it at the same time, you know, yeah. they're really zeroing in on a date. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Jack. Yeah. So, you know, all of those things being considered, I mean, I think that history books have already been rewritten, uh, by this. And, and, and like you said, you know, th- that's one of the things that's really important to Rick. And it's really important to me now, um, now that I'm involved in this. Um, and so it, it's already happening. And I think that's, if I'm able to just, you know, make one tiny contribution to that, uh, you know, someone could, could, you know, do a bunch of research and, um, you know, uh, and suddenly all, everything that I've discovered on the plaque could be just small potatoes by comparison for all I know. Um, because you just don't know, uh, you know, someone, you know, you never know what someone else is going to uh, make as a discovery at any given time. So, um, that, that, that's a big part of it for sure. Yeah. And I, I missed the question that you posted up there. Oh, it was just talking about the, uh, the boot, uh, this, the piece of leather, uh, the oh, boot yeah. heel that was found and you had kind of mentioned it already. That's why I brought it up because, uh, Jenny, uh, mentioned that as well. You Hi know, Jenny. Could, could, could that be his boot? Could that be part of of Sir Francis Bacon's? Uh, uh, you know, I, I, who knows? I, yeah. Oh my God. Um, Do you and, have you know, a lot of history of when he came over and where he was and everything, or is that still kind of filling the blank proposition? Um, not. It's not a blank proposition in that sense, but uh, he definitely played a huge role in. Uh, Montreal and, and definitely, you know, Nova Scotia as well. So, um, you know, he, you kind of see his, um, his, his, his face on a lot of different, uh, and, and fingerprints on a lot of different areas here, particularly, you know, in the area where, where I currently live. Um, you know, I'm, I'm live in St. Lawrence County, New York. Um, and you know, I've, um, we're only a, a little over an hour away from Montreal, and, and so, um, it, it, I, I just find it really fascinating and interesting. And like I, I was telling you guys in the pre-show, as soon as the border opens up, I'm, I have some road trips planned. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can well, all hope that happens soon. Yeah. Right. Here's something that a, uh, a, a viewer, uh, brought up and this is, uh, John Edwards brought this up and I, and I, and I saw it, but I didn't, I don't know anything about this. I'm going to bring it up let you check it out. This is John Edwards said this, the King James version of the Bible is coded. Did, did Bacon edit that? Was he part of yeah. that? Yes, he was. Um, oh, and as, as such, uh, well, King James was his younger half brother, according to my research. Wow. And so, and and if you recall, um, you know, Bacon didn't really rise to any of his, you know, positions of of power until James ascended the throne. Uh, Elizabeth was was keeping him, you know, in her in her sight at arm's length, mm-hmm. but wasn't allowing him to, you know, do too much. It looks like. Um, and it wasn't until he uh, ascended the throne. One, one of the key messages, actually, of the ciphertext was that he loved seeing James on the throne. He loved seeing his brother, James, on the throne. Wow. It made him happy. Um, and so I, I, I found that to be really, really fascinating. So, yeah, um, a lot of scholars have indicated that the King James Version has multiple uh, ciphers uh, encrypted in it. Sure. 
Wow. Yeah, and he's just talking about uh, that's and that's John again talking about yeah. Psalm forty six. Psalms forty six. I'm gonna have to. I mean, so there's some enc- some encoding in the King James version of the Bible, huh? And I am a Christian. I tell you, and I and I try to read the King James version. I cannot do it. I mean, it's just it just it, I can't understand it. So I, I got the, uh, yeah, the yeah. NIV. I go through the NIV version. That's what I go with. But uh, but man, oh man, I mean, the King James is just so you know uh, the and thy and so much of that stuff going on. It loses me. Well, yeah. When when I read it, I I, I see Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do, I do. I, and since I, you know, I teach people how to understand Shakespeare. Uh, when I read it, I, you know, I of course can see it and understand it. But, um, and this is John again. Yep. So I'm gonna have to look at it now. And now, yeah. Now I'm gonna have to take a look. <laughs> As, as oh. if I didn't have enough on my plate to look at, I'm gonna, I'm dead, I'm gonna be jumping into that <laughs> as as done here, right? Yeah. yeah, so we are, yeah, we've been about an hour and forty three minutes, and we're getting ready to wow. wrap it up here. I try not to uh, go anything more than two hours, and and uh, we try to keep it at that. But I tell you what, boy, this has been fascinating, and um, been fascinating. I, I knew, I knew that this 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 uh, show, having you on here, was going to be a, such an education for us all. I cannot wait to uh, read your book that is coming. I'm going to get it any day now. It's going to, I think it's actually not good. They said it's going to show up on Monday. I'm really looking forward to reading that. And uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing what you are hopefully going to present uh, in the war room uh, this season in season. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, it's funny you mentioned that. And by the way, thanks for your kind words. I, I appreciate that very much. Um, I, I didn't realize that so much time had already passed. Uh, this has been so uh, a lot of fun for me. Um, yeah, you know, that that's the nature of, you know, presenting information to the guys on Oak Island is, um, you know, there's so many people out there who they, we all think, oh, I have this thing solved, <laughs> right? Um, mm-hmm. I have it figured out. And I every- said that for 220 some years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And and that's why they call it a money pit, right? Uh, people have sunk <laughs> money into it. Uh, yeah. that's, that's the treasure in there. But, um, you know, it, the big thing is, is that, um, you know, you, you put these ideas out there uh, and you, uh, like you had said, Rick wants to know who, what, why, where, when, and, and how, uh, and, and connect the dots. That was the big thing. Um, you know, when I did my presentation was I, I made sure I connected the dots and, uh, that was one of the things that they really liked. Um, and, and now, uh, with my latest work, uh, th- that I've, I've sent them, um, I, I I've done that even more so I think. And so, but the big thing is, is that, you know, it, especially your, your uh, viewers and, and, and group members out there. Uh, if you have a theory and, and, and you send it in, uh, definitely send in, but you, the big thing is you have to remember that they're getting, you know, so many of these every day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and every single one of us, you know, we all think that we, we have it figured out, you know? Um, and you know, that's kind of, uh, the, I, I don't know, I guess I, it, it's, it's the allure of it isn't it the mystery yeah. uh, but also i mean the real treasure there is um a, a different tea it's a tau it's the truth you know and and you alluded to that earlier in terms of what we're kind of uncovering in terms of uh how it's changing history um all of it and so you know it, it, if you're one of those uh, folks out there and you have a theory and you send it in um you know keep at it you know it, it's one of those things where um yeah, it, it's, you know, this kind of competitive thing, but, but it's not competitive in a lot of ways because we, we all kind of encourage each, each other, all of the theorists, um, and, you know, we pat each other on the back. One thing I wanted to know yeah. is when you made your presentation, kind of what was it like? I mean, oh. describe, <laughs> describe it in a sense. I mean, were you nervous about it? Did they make you feel welcome? Just oh, kind of a general you- overview. You know, that's uh, thanks for asking that, Jack. That's because it, it's definitely one of um, my favorite memories um, <laughs> for sure. Uh, I was nervous at first, uh, but then once I, I started doing it, and of course it was it was just like this. It was via uh, Zoom. And so um, I had been teaching that way for the previous six months. <laughs> mm, yeah, <laughs> And so I, I was kind of used to doing a presentation every once in a while. Um, and so I knew how to, uh, operate it, but 
you know, one of the things that uh, it's one of the running jokes apparently um, on the show is, you know, we, we were scheduled for a specific time to present and we're all there, we're all waiting. And, um, you know, I, I could see Rick or not Rick. Um, I could hear Rick, but they were all the guys in the war room. Uh, their screens were black because they couldn't get them to show or something. I, I don't know what the deal was. Um, I, I could see uh, Marty. I could see Alex. And we're all just sitting around waiting for production to basically <laughs> make things work. <laughs> you know, they're running into a lot of problems, uh, in, uh, obviously, in the war room on Oak Island because, well, it's Oak Island, right? It's Oak Island, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, we're sitting there, and um, Chris Dona was going to be presenting right after me. So we were um, all sitting there like the three of us are now. And so it was funny, uh, Marty and Alex were kind of visiting because Alex was um, in um, quarantine uh, in Nova Scotia in their, their house there. Uh, Marty was back in Michigan and, <clears throat> and they were kind of visiting back and Chris and I were talking. And then we just started all talking to each other. And, you know, the way they come across on the show is just being regular, normal guys. That's how they really are. Uh, they're just really nice, uh, uh, very genuine people, uh, very uh, reassuring and and encouraging. Um, and so that really went, you know, a long way to helping me relax. And um, and of course, Chris made me uh, go first. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you okay, were you were to be bigger. Right? I'll I'll take, I'll take the hit. Yeah. Um, and so. But at the end of the day, I mean, we had such an, uh, we went long, longer than we normally uh, had planned to. We got a late start, a late finish. And by the end of it, we were all visiting and, and just, you know, just enjoying talking to each other. And, uh, and the same thing happened with my uh, second presentation with Aaron. Um, you know, there, there, there's, like I said, the way they come across on TV and the way we all feel like we know them, uh, that's how they really are. It, it was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank and I you. wanted to, uh, to also say there that, uh, again, uh, folks, uh, you got to check out his, uh, his website, the ghost of bacon, uh, com, And also, and, and did I get that right? The name of the book, the Holy Trinity decryption. Yes, that's it. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. yeah. And I had a picture of the book. It was in the intro I had, but I was just trying to find it so I could actually put the picture up there and it's got that plaque on the front of it. And of course it says this on top. Uh, folks, check out that book. I got it on Amazon. I went right out to Amazon, found it just in a matter of moments. It was there and I ordered it. It's on its way. I cannot wait to read it, but I'm telling you folks that uh, if, if this kind of stuff interests you and it should, and if it wants to lead you to what may be coming up uh, in its relationship to Oak Island, you need to check this out and and watch for uh, Jake. I, you're a natural with it, you know, coming online oh, and giving right, right. Your, your presentations that you've done. Obviously, you said you've been doing your teaching and Zoom call style for a while. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, watching you present uh, when I the, the shows that I watched you uh, given, you know, going through what you were talking about earlier, uh, showing us with the um, with your PowerPoint. Um, you do it very, very well. It's very, and it's, and it's done in such a way that somebody that's uneducated like myself can understand. Right. Um, and, but you got to pay attention. You can't drift off for a moment and be looking at, like I said, looking at that text, you got to be paying attention. Right. But, but your YouTube page is like that too, because I went to a couple of your presentations on there and I really enjoyed them. Yep. Oh, thanks so much guys. I, I appreciate your kind words very much. Um, yeah. But you know, it, it a couple of things. Uh, hopefully, I, I I better be good at it because I teach people how to do it first of all. <laughs> <laughs> but as as a caveat, you know, uh, be kind with the editing of my book because I, there are some things that I missed there. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> so, all right. <laughs> but you know, I, I went through and uh, uh, after the fact, and I, I've I've cleaned it up since then. So. Uh, it, it's in a much uh, cleaner form at this point. But like I said, I, I'm sure that there are things that we missed along the way. So, Oh, so, so you say that there's some of the original ones, the original uh, books out that have some, oh, so they might that, be worth the money then. May, maybe, yeah. <laughs> it might be like that nickel that has the little, you know, you know, thing that's wrong on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 See? Money, penny. yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there are a few of those floating around, but uh, like I said, wow. it, made the changes so wow this has absolutely been fascinating folks i hope you've enjoyed this oh. as much as i have i know jack uh has and uh oh, everybody, you know, we, there's been so many so comments much. yeah thank we you really do. 
if you get a chance, I know there was there was a lot of comments, and and I I bring this up with all of the folks that I have on on the show, and I um in our Facebook group, um, and I encourage folks that you are watching over on the YouTube side, we appreciate you very much. Click on that subscribe button for us if you would. But if you really want to see all that's happening on our Facebook group and the discussions that we have, you know you can you know just come and ask to join, and then we'll check you out and bring you in, and you can join the group with us. Um, but Jake, I'd like to say that there's been so much chat going by here. If you get an opportunity, I know you're a very busy man, but if you get an opportunity to check some of that out, and then there might be some questions that we missed somewhere along the way. And if you get a chance absolutely. to take a look at that, maybe. I absolutely. Um, follow up. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. Again, sir, thank you so much. I didn't know if you had any other parting words you wanted to say before we go. No, I just want to say, you know, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I really enjoy uh, visiting with you guys. Um, hope we can do it again soon. And, um, we got to get into season nine so you can tell us some more stuff. Season nine, baby. <laughs> it, that will definitely happen, Jack. You, you, you have me promising there. You have me on the I record. mean, I, re I really thank you for coming on. Yeah, absolutely. I know I asked a lot of questions. You probably went, hmm, where did that come from? But No, not at all. <laughs> they were great questions. Um, and you have to understand with this, this kind of stuff, uh, I, I get asked all kinds of things all the time uh, because it, there, there's just so much to it. You know, it's, it's pretty complex. You know, it really is. But yep. Um, at the end of the day, like you said, I think that uh, in my future, uh, my own show, uh, I'm going to be giving smaller little bites, smaller little tidbits instead of, you know, having to do like a an hour and a half marathon. Or two hour show like we just did. Yeah, no, like no, no. Just, yeah. I, I love the long <laughs> format. It, it, it just really allows us to really kind of stretch our legs here and uh, mm -hmm. uh, dig into stuff. So I, I really like that a lot. Right. Well, again, thank you so much for coming on. And folks, I hope you enjoyed this. And thank you guys for being here. That's why we do this. We do this for the members so that we uh, we can all enjoy uh, what our special guest like Jake has to share and uh, and learn something in the same process. Again, thank you so much. Thanks, Jack, for being here. Linda thank and Jan you. out there. Thank you, folks, for doing what you do. We appreciate you very much. Everyone have a great rest of your Saturday afternoon. All right. Bye-bye now.